Well, before I get started, I want you to know I'm not trying to bait and switch you. Uh, this series is called Little Jesus, and maybe you got to this video because you were Googling something about a little Jesus. Well, maybe somebody invited you to check this out because they said you need a little Jesus, or maybe they gave you a toy like this one in this picture. And while that might be cute, I, I got to tell you something. I don't really believe in a little Jesus. Have you ever seen that movie from Talladega Nights where the main character prays to sweet little baby Jesus? What makes that hilarious is that I think people do try to make Jesus into what they want him to be. And maybe you prefer a sweet little baby Jesus, or maybe you prefer a white floating Jesus who never raises his voice unless it is to smite thee. Maybe you prefer a political Jesus who goes along with all of your party ideology. But as for me, I don't believe Jesus is little. I've heard people say, that person needs a little Jesus. I never met anybody who needed a little Jesus. On the other hand, uh, you may have heard somebody say that person needs a little Jesus and then they actually experienced and felt hope. Maybe you were going through something, just hearing the name of Jesus moved something in you and you were drawn to him. You know, the whole idea of this series, it came from a friend of mine who was in this challenging place. He was going through a personal trial like so many of us go through and he saw a, a little Jesus and he felt better. He had hope. More than just the idea of a little Jesus, I think he felt the reality of God in Jesus and it brought, it brought light into his life. He saw this and thought of the Jesus he had heard about, the Jesus who heals, the Jesus who brings hope, the Jesus who fills the void and empty places in our soul. I love that. The sold out purpose of the Journey Church is that Jesus is the light of the world and we exist to engage you with the love of Christ so that all families may experience hope and healing and wholeness. And if that's why you're watching, I'm excited. When you experience Christ's love, whether you're trying to live it out or just trying to receive it, it's not a little thing. But in our culture, in our daily lives, we might be tempted to belittle Jesus. Not on purpose, but it happens. We try to make Jesus fit into our lives, our agenda, our plans. But listen, Jesus is not an additive to your schedule. He's not part of a recipe for a good life. He's not chicken soup for your soul. He's not a way to make more money. He's not affiliated with a political party. And when we try to make Jesus into something he is not, we belittle him. Listen, something you should know. He doesn't ask to be part of your life. Jesus has a much bigger ask for us. Jesus wants all of your life. He wants all of you to have all of him. This was such a big deal, especially in the early church. When non-Jewish people began to believe and follow Jesus in small communities of the first century, it came with great personal risk and at a great personal cost because the Roman culture promoted state worship as an integral part of the whole. So when Jesus' communities first started, at first it was kind of okay, you could do your thing, as long as it didn't interfere with Roman life. But when Jesus' communities wouldn't allow Jesus to be equal to or part of the other gods or cults of Roman culture, uh, that was bad. Christians saw that as making Jesus a little Jesus, another God, a literal another little Jesus. Second century Christian preacher a guy named Clement writes about the danger of making Jesus too little. He says, brothers, we ought to think of Jesus as we do of God. And we ought not to belittle our salvation. For when we belittle him, we hope to get but little. And this stance, it made Romans hate Christians. They called them atheists because they refused to equate Jesus with other gods. Christians believed in and lived for the one God, the God who came to earth to live, die, rise, live, and reign with God, the Father, as one. There was no such thing as a little Jesus. It's all or nothing. So when you think about Jesus today, I hope you may consider the great cost that the first century and second century Christians had to pay to follow Jesus. They died for their faith. Some would rather be torn apart by wild animals or set on fire than belittle Jesus. 
sure, a little Jesus probably will make a big difference in your life. Jesus is all about hope and healing and wholeness. But if you want to see something truly powerful happen in your life, you need to know that a little Jesus may go a long way, but it is not enough. I want to stop. I want to pray before I tell you the rest of this story, this message, and I want to ask you a question. So let's pray. Father, as we look into your word, let us see all of you. Help us to understand the deep, powerful love and great cost Jesus paid so that we might be restored to you. Help us not to belittle you, Lord, but instead to see you for all you are. Use our, our hearts and minds in such a way to see you in ways we never imagined. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to ask you a question. Listen, have you ever heard somebody say that person needs a little Jesus? Has somebody ever told you that? What do you think about the idea of a little Jesus? I want you to pause the video, reflect on this question for a minute, and then when we come back, I want to share a powerful story where some people had an idea of who they thought Jesus was, but it was smaller. It was smaller than who he actually was. When Jesus walked the earth, he lived as a traveling rabbi. And where he went, he taught. He did miraculous things, and it made him pretty popular with the common people. His primary message was this, the kingdom of God is at hand, which basically means God's holy presence is breaking into this reality here and now. And this bold claim was evidenced by the things Jesus said and did. He taught things like love your enemies and pray for them. If you harbor hate in your heart, you're basically a murderer. Thinking about adultery is just as bad as doing the act itself. Jesus wanted people to live like someone who promotes and preserves Life, like salt, preserves and flavors food. You are the salt of the earth. In Jesus' words and deeds, they brought hope to the hopeless, healing to the sick, and wholeness to the broken. Jesus would teach and empower his followers to, to be like him. One day, Jesus and his followers, they, they encountered this large crowd who desperately wanted to hear Jesus' words and receive his healing in their lives. They were hungry for hope and healing and wholeness. And Jesus had compassion for them. He felt empathy. He wanted to help. Listen, this is important. Jesus identified the need of the people. We're followers of Jesus. This is something for us to take. Jesus identified their need. And it was a lot of people. The gospel writers say there were like 5,000 men there, which doesn't count the women and children who were already with them. So a better number might be 15,000 people, which is huge. People coming from all around to hear Jesus. And this isn't a big city they came to. It was sort of rural. And they had to know that when they made this trip, when they made this commitment, they might have to go hungry for a while. They might have to sleep outdoors. There weren't any motels or 7-Elevens or Kroger's. Jesus' disciples, they see this. They know this. And they don't really want the people to suffer either. And so they offer a solution to the problem. Here's what they say. Send them away so they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. Now, how would that sound today? Jesus, there's a lot of people here and they need food. And if they don't get it, we might have bigger problems. People passing out, people might start stealing, people might start wandering around hungry. And what would that takeaway be when they come to hear you and all they are is hungry? And it's funny to me, even when Jesus is present, we likely have no idea how powerful he is. Or when we think things are scarce, like food or lodging, is it possible that he's more than enough? Now, Jesus takes his follower, followers from a dilemma to a breakthrough to a blessing. Here's what he does. He responds to them like this. You give them something to eat, he responded. Which is fascinating, isn't it? Who is Jesus saying should feed the people? the disciples. And I think the disciples are taken off guard because listen to how they respond. They said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Now, the disciples are thinking like this is way too big a task. They see feeding this group as something that's way outside their capacity to do. 200 denarii is like half a year's wages. 
and they feel totally limited because they have a fear of scarcity. They can only see what they don't have. Maybe you do that. Maybe you can only see what you don't have. That your house isn't big enough. You can only see what you don't have. That your car isn't enough. For you. you can only see what you don't have. And you compare yourself to other people. You can only see what you don't have. And you think you don't have the ability or the, the capacity to help others because you can only see what you don't have. Now, one of the disciples says, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. They can only see what they don't have. Jesus flips it around. He says, what do you have? What do you have to offer? Here's what he says. Jesus, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, we have five, five loaves and two fish. Now, I wonder what that conversation was like. Hey, Jesus. All we got here is five little loaves of bread and five little fish. And Jesus took what they had, he blessed it, and distributed it, and it was more than enough. And this isn't done like in some mystical way. It's done so everybody who's there can see it happen. All the disciples, all the people who came to hear Jesus, all the people who were questioning Jesus, all the people who doubted Jesus, everybody sees this happen. So there's a dilemma this hungry crowd, there was a breakthrough, Jesus' power through the disciples, and there's a blessing. The people are fed. And the scripture says, everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. They had enough baskets for each of the disciples, the key disciples, to have extra bread and fish. Now, those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. Remember, I told you, that's how many people were there. So that's more than probably 15,000 people. Now, I need to tell you something. That's wonderful. That's amazing. It's fantastic. Look what Jesus can do. We shouldn't look at our scarcity. We should think about Jesus' power. But I need to tell you something. Even then, you might not think enough of Jesus. Because this isn't the end of the bread story. After he fed the crowd, Jesus and his disciples crossed a nearby lake overnight to get to another town. And most of the crowd that had been fed, they, they find out where Jesus went and they seek him out. And maybe they were thinking, wow, this guy fed me miraculously. He could be our king. Or if I know what he did, I could be fed forever. If this man were gentle, he could feed an army. Just like God fed our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. So these people, they cross the lake, they find Jesus and they ask Jesus, how can I make it so I have bread every day? Here's what they say. Here's what they literally say. What can we do to perform the works of God? They want to know how to make that bread. And it sounds good. I mean, you know, but what they're asking, actually asking Jesus is, how do I do that bread trick? What is the work of God? It, it's almost like they're making it sort of a Harry Potter thing. And Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. Whoa. Jesus is saying, look, I need you to identify what God is doing right here, right now, and join him. He identified the need of the people, and his power through disciples brought the blessing. Now, he's saying, I need you to identify what's happening right here, right now, and join him. Maybe you have a need, a prayer that you want Jesus to address. Maybe you want your spouse to be less irritating, your kids to be more controllable, your friends to be more trustworthy, you want a better job, a bigger house, more money. And I have to wonder when I start to think like that, am I thinking too small? Jesus is saying, I know what you need, what you really need is right here. So the people, they kind of get it. They, oh, you, you're the one that we've been looking for who can answer our deepest questions. Well, are you the one? Well, how will we really know? And so they ask him another question because it's hard for them to get past their picture of who they think Jesus should be. So they say, what sign then? What sign are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked. Listen to this. What are you going to perform? Well, he just did something amazing. 
He just did something they all saw. And now they're asking for another trick. And they're thinking about a prophet from the past. They said, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. Just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, they have a picture of who Jesus could be. But it's a little Jesus. Oh, they want him to perform a miracle, a trick. That will fill their bellies. That will meet the immediate need. They remember the story of Moses and how God gave the people food. Actually, God gave the people food. They, they credit Moses with it, but God did it. And they're like, we, we, we want to see that. Can you make that happen? Hook us up with breakfast, Jesus. They have a little view of Jesus. They want a little Jesus. And they want him to do something, which he's already done, by the way. But they don't see what he's really asking. And so Jesus says, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Get ready. Here it comes. Jesus says, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me and you, you don't believe. Wow, that had to be hard for them. Jesus says, you've seen me, you've heard me, you've experienced my blessing, and you still can't identify who I am. What is God is saying to you today? You want my blessing? I'm right here in front of you. I wonder how many times people miss the blessing that is right in front of them. We ask God to heal, and he does. We rethink, but we rethink what God does, and we say, well, you know, maybe it was something else. We ask God to heal our marriage, and it happens, and then people around go, well, you know, they just worked it out. God heals a person's physical illness, and we go, well, maybe they just got misdiagnosed. We ask God to intervene on our behalf, and he does, and then we think too small because we want a little Jesus. And we get upset when God doesn't perform for us. Maybe we ask for financial relief, but we spend it poorly, we lose what he gives. We ask God to help our relationships get better. But we don't try to mature and grow up ourselves. We ask and we don't get because we don't ask for the right things. And we do ask. We're asking for quick fixes that satiate our desires. And yet, I have to tell you, there are no small portions of Jesus. Jesus tells the people they cannot identify the one in front of them. They can't see the enormous good that's being done. They can't really... They can't really identify what they actually need. They can't see Jesus for who he is. So then, man, he drops this other bomb. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And I think they're like, what? They start to realize that maybe Jesus is more than just what they thought, and that is hard to hear. I want to tell you, little Jesus is for a day, but Jesus, Jesus Christ is forever. Little Jesus is temporary, but Jesus, he's eternal. So what do you want? Do you want a little Jesus just works for the day, or do you want Jesus, who is the path to real life now and forever? And what if Jesus was here right now? What, what would you do? Could you identify him? and not be distracted by little Jesus? Hey, let me, let me just stop and ask you a question. What do you have that you think is not enough? What could God do with your not enough that might be more than enough? How are you going to see Jesus in your life now? Man, that's a tough one, right? Stop the video, pray about that, think about that, reflect on that, talk about it with someone. And when you're done, come back, and I wanna talk about how we can identify. When I tell you that I want us to be able to identify Jesus, it's more than just seeing Jesus in my place. I want you to get past the idea of little Jesus. I want you to understand that not only is he present, like you're watching this video now, he's present now, 
and he is calling you to a deeper presence in your community, in your life, to have an impact to the people around you. Identify. So here's three things I want you to do that I think you can identify both where God is and how he wants you to act in the world. And the first one is real simple, like identify. You have to look. Look, where is God working? What is he doing? And when you see it, join him. When we're praying, it draws us close to God. And a consistent part of our prayer life should be that we ask God to see as he sees with compassion and love. New Testament writer Paul says, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. We should ask God to see what he wants us to see with his perspective, a perspective that is not limited by scarcity or our ability, but it is in the context of his power to work in and through us. Do you want to identify, do you want to see God in your life and then working out? See where God is working and join him. Look, where is God working and join him? And the second thing is this. I want you to listen. Listen, and I know this is going to freak you out a little bit. Listen for God's voice. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to hear God audibly. Uh, I don't know, though. I mean, you could. I just never heard of that. I mean, it could happen to people. I've heard people say it. But you can hear God in many other ways. I'm saying pay attention. God is speaking to you through his word through godly friends, through circumstances. Are you listening? Instead of seeking your own agenda and your own way, navigating your own views, maybe you should listen for God. Listen for the people in your life who are hungry for hope, hungry for healing, desiring wholeness. I love the way James tells us to listen. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. He's, he's talking about not letting your emotions supercharge your decisions, but more than that, listening should be the way we are all the time. Listening for God and listening to people and listening for God as he works in us, through us, Two people. We need to listen. So if we want to identify, we have to, we have to look, we have to listen, and then, and this is going to be wild, remember Jesus invited. A sort of a come and see. Now notice that Jesus is the only one who makes an invitation after feeding the people. He invites them to eat his body and drink his blood. Now, he's not being cannibalistic. What he's saying is, it's all or nothing. There's no little Jesus. His invitation seems like a lot to people who sought him out, but it's life-giving. What about you? If you're looking for God's work, it may be very close. Maybe you are all in for Jesus. Maybe you can make an invitation. Listen. Look. See where God is working, how he could use you. Now, maybe you can invite someone to lunch. And maybe you can listen to their life and maybe you can tell them about the Jesus who's more than they ever imagined. Maybe you can invite them to a community of believers near you. Maybe you can invite them to the Journey Church in Chesapeake. Any Sunday morning worship gathering, you can ask them to come and sit with me. Maybe you can just seek to be a good friend and invite to build a relationship over time, a life of selflessness not scarcity. It allows us to move from crisis to breakthrough to blessing, all because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we always find more than enough for our soul. But listen, be aware, a little Jesus, it might be good, but it's not what you need. You may think a little Jesus is going to address your need for today, and it might, but Jesus has so much more in mind for you and for the world. A little Jesus may go a long way, but it is not enough. Listen, as we think and reflect today, as we spend time in this worship song, I want you to pray, reflect on three questions. Number one, what do I have to offer? Let me not think about what I don't have to offer, but what I do have to offer. Where is Jesus already at work in me? And if I join Jesus in the world, who should I invite to go with me? May you 
May you feel God's spirit move in you to answer this invitational question, to grow the community of believers worldwide. I don't care where you're at. And the Journey Church is great, but I'm not asking for the Journey Church. I'm asking for Jesus' church. Think about how you can use what you have, see how Jesus is working in you already, join Jesus in the world, and invite people to go with you. With that in mind, let's worship together. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Sing faithful. I will rest church.